Welcome to the Christmas special of the Tech Leaders Podcast. And wow, have we got a great guest for this festive occasion, Jazz Carlin. You may have heard of her. Um, she was all over our screens for a number of years during the Olympics, the Commonwealth Games, and so on and so forth. Jazz started as a competitive swimmer at the age of seven and is now, having retired at the age of 28, an Olympic silver medalist, a double silver medalist, Commonwealth Games, and a European gold medalist, uh, and has also recently embarked on a career in technology. Uh, Jazz talks about her incredible career with amazing lessons that she has learned and the wisdom and habits that she cultivated during that time in her life that she's taken through into her new professional career. Uh, Jazz talked candidly about, about making sacrifices to become an elite competitor, but about being the least competitive person in her family, uh, missing out on London 2012 and, and the, the, the setback uh, and, and the uh, disappointment of that and, and bouncing back, plus her experience of transitioning from a competitive swimmer into a business person working in the tech sector. What an episode. This is Jazz Carlin. Jazz, thank you so much for coming on the Tech Leaders Podcast. I've been really excited about this one. Lovely Christmas tree. How, how, how are things with you? <laughs> yeah, it's great actually to um, come on to a podcast where I'm not, I guess, talking about sport all the time. Um, it's messing it up, <laughs> I guess, this time, which is nice. But no, all is really well. Thank you. Feeling pretty festive. And yeah, looking forward to Christmas and the end of the year. So all really positive. I am, unfortunately, or fortunately for the listeners, going to ask you a little bit about your sport and career, Jazz. How could we not do that? Let's just start with this one, though. Obviously, with a leadership podcast, what does good leadership mean to you? Oh, it's a great question and probably one that I could talk about for the whole podcast, really. I've been very lucky to have some incredible leaders through sport, which I feel like I've kind of learned so many different things from the coaches and the leaders that I've been surrounded by. But I guess taking bits and using it from my personality and what I'm like as well. But I think for me, great leadership is being able to lead from the front, leading by example. And it's just super important to have the kind of bond and relationship, you know, where there's open communication, there's full trust and respect. And I guess being able to kind of, I say like the door's always open, feeling like you are there for your team and that you're going through it with them. So that support is huge. And I, I do think kind of leading by example and being able to support them as much as possible. It's it's a really difficult sure. one because I could talk about it for so long. So yeah, many different sure. areas, but um, they would probably be my roundup. Let me, let me spin it like this then, Jazz. What if I was to call up one of your colleagues, peers, team members, what do you think they would say about you? How would they describe Jazz, do you think? Oh, it's a difficult one. <laughs> I'm ever much like an optimist. I am very positive. I always try and see the positive in like every situation on how we can actually see, you know, whether it is an obstacle or a hurdle, just how can we get over it? I think giving as much support, I am very much one for a process. I get a lot of my team to focus on the process on how they're going to try and achieve their outcome, taking off the little things during the week that's going to give them the outcome they want at the end of the week. But I guess it's hard to describe how people would describe myself, but I guess <laughs> knowing that I'm there to support, I'm always there for them, but also there to kind of push them and challenge them to, to see what they can achieve as well. Yeah, definitely. Now, I know this is a bit of a, a not a popular question with everyone, but I, I just wanted to ask you to give us a little bit of a high level overview of your career for people who don't know who you are and where you are now. Yeah, so my name is Jazz. I come from a sporting background. So I'm a former Team GB and Welsh swimmer. I won two silver medals at the Rio 2016 Olympics in the 400 and 800 meters freestyle. So probably the long events where everyone's like, oh my God, they were four minutes and eight minutes long. Also competed at four Commonwealth Games and carried the Welsh flag at the 2018 Commonwealth Games. So hey. <laughs> really special, really special memories through, through sport. But you know, I when I look back, I guess, at my career and, you know, the medals and everything, the thing I probably look at the most, you know, is the journey that, that it took to get me there, you know, swimming 75 kilometers a week, doing three gym sessions, overcoming the disappointments, bouncing back from, I guess, the, the bad swims, the disappointing ones. 
and how much I've learned about myself along the way. And um, as I said, I am a very positive person. I'm very optimistic. And I think I've learned so much from my swimming career that I'm kind of using now in my in my new role and new career that I often do refer to it because I think there's so many different learnings that I've I've brought along the way. So um, it'd be a shame not to use them. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, yeah, you, you've obviously had a sterling career. And like, as we said, uh, just before we came on air, you must be very proud. But, but so, so I, w- I want to unpack that a little bit. Okay, so if we could just go back and cast your mind back to the early days when you were obviously swimming an ungodly amount of lengths at an ungodly hour in the morning before school and things like that. So that part of your life. But I understand that you had a bit of a setback very early on, didn't you? You didn't get selected for the Smart Track program by British Swimming. How did you bounce back from that? Yeah, it's funny when you look back and I was 13 years old and the Smart Track program, to give a bit of context, that was where um, British Swimming felt like they would find the next kind of Olympic stars, the next future stars of the of the sport. And, you know, I was taken into a room and my height was measured, my wingspan, my weight, my jump, uh, my mum and dad's heights and weights were measured. It was a full on kind of interrogation, wow. really. And from that, they deemed that they were actually going to, I guess, find the the future stars in our sport, in swimming. So a couple of weeks later, I found out that I actually wasn't picked to be a part of the kind of core program, which obviously as a young girl was very disappointing and seeing kind of teammates and friends and different people, I guess, being selected. And they had so many different opportunities traveling the world, going on training camps and went to Australia, I remember, and I was thinking, oh, I would love to have been a part of that. But I guess like at the time, I was very lucky and fortunate to have incredible people around me from my swimming coach who was very kind of inspirational for me but also my mum and dad that kind of have always been I guess that had that belief in me and given me that positive encouragement and I think you know part of me really just wanted to like that was my dream and how could someone tell me that you know I didn't have a chance of making it go to go to the Olympics or I wasn't Mm. one of the future stars of the sport it was like I was in control of that and yeah. even at a young age I remember thinking I just want to prove them wrong and I want to go out and that's my dream and like how dare someone kind of say to me you know that I'm not part of that program I'm going to go out there and do absolutely everything I can to sure. to come back and give it my best shot. Absolutely and wow did you go and do that. When you speak to people who have performed you know at an elite level in their field they've often got a bit of a chip on their shoulder because they had some early setback of that nature. Was that the case with you, Jazz? Did you did you feel you had something to prove them for the rest of your career? Oh, it's a difficult one to say. I think there's constant challenges throughout my career. When I look back, there's been many times where I've been doubted or I've been taken off funding when I missed out yeah. on the London 2012 Olympics. And I guess there has been that element of, you know, wanting to come back stronger than ever. But I guess more so than ever, it's kind of proven to myself. I wanted to show myself that I could do it and that, you know, I work as hard as anyone, you know, I will give my hundred and whatever percent to be at my best. And I guess it's kind of, you know, there could be a hundred voices, whether that's in your head or people around you telling you, oh, you you can't do this. You're not ready or, um, but listening to kind of like that one voice that's telling you, no, I can do this and I'm going to give absolutely everything I can to do it. So yeah, I guess there's been lots of challenges and I'd be lying to say if they didn't drive me you know I think you know sometimes the biggest of disappointments can lead you on to the biggest triumphs and the biggest results in my career have come from really disappointing times but I've learned so much about myself that's actually kind of given me a slingshot to to come back stronger than ever. In terms of setbacks then I know you do some coaching. So I work with swimmers out on my swimmer jazz program and yeah I basically coach from one-to-ones swimming camps Um, a bit of mentoring as well so I kind of mix it up with different things in the sport and it still allows me to still stay involved in the sport and still help out as much as possible and give back to a sport that I guess I've done for so long I guess for me it's it's probably quite different you know when I coach and when I work with swimmers for me it's about giving every swimmer a really positive experience of the sport you know it breaks my heart when I see swimmers that aren't enjoying it or had kind of negative experiences of swimming that has then led on to later in life maybe not carrying on with the sport so I really try and give them all the tools that they'll need to I guess have in their their kind of kit bag to make sure that they have all the tools needed to progress but also giving them a real positive experience of the sport that they can then, you know, whether that is a dream to go on to the Olympics or whether it's just a dream to be able to, you know, keep going with the sport and have a real 
I guess, positive outlook on the sport. Maybe it's for their mental well-being. I just try and make sure that every swimmer that I work with has a real kind of positive, positive impact of the sport. Coming from you, I'm sure that's really powerful for them, you know, obviously because you've you've just been there and done it, haven't you? But what do you say to them then if they do have a a significant setback in their journey? What what kind of advice do you give? Are you good on the motivational side? Do you work much on that that sort of type of stuff? (laughs) I'd like to think so. And to be honest, I think it all all comes back from experience. I always draw back from experience. I actually didn't improve in swimming from the age of 14 to 17. And that's, you know, having no signs of improvement, no best times, we call them in swimming. And also the times, you know, where I have had to overcome challenges and, you know, missed out on the Olympics. And I do use my experiences a lot because I think being able to be relatable, being able to have swimmers that understand that you've gone through the same thing and, as I say, breaking down with the process instead of always focusing on the outcome, whether that is, you know, a medal or a best time or this focus on the process and break it down. So then, you know, you put yourself in the best possible position to achieve the outcome. Mm. So, um, yeah, I think I always draw on experience and I, you know, would like to think that I can hopefully motivate and inspire all the athletes I work with, whether that, as I said, whether the dream is to go on to go to the Olympics or whether the dream is to just be competitive at a county level or, you know, whichever level that that is, I I hope that I can obviously have, have an impact on them and hopefully motivate them and inspire them to go on and achieve whatever that is that they, that they want to. Sure. Absolutely. So let's go back to your early career then. You moved away at the age of 16 and that must have been quite daunting. You you were very young. You've made this enormous commitment that you were going to try and push yourself to become an elite swimmer, go to a major games and you moved to Swansea. Is that right? Yeah. So it was a difficult decision, you know, at 16 years old to decide whether I push on with my swimming career, I was advised by my old swimming club, look, we can't give you any more pool time. It's obviously restricted when you're at a swimming club. And I was offered an incredible opportunity with Swim Wales at Swansea. So from my family side being Welsh, I decided, you know, that was an incredible opportunity for me to move away from home at 16. And it was, I guess that kind of decision making, do you go left? Do you go right? Do you stick with left with the road that you're going on where you know, there's, there aren't as many, many hours in the pool at your swimming club. And I guess maybe not being pushed as hard as I, as I could have been and go into the same school, staying with friends, or do I go right and kind of take a risk and move away from, from my family home, move away from friends and, um, start a new training program with a world-class coach that was coming in for, for for distance swimming, which was my event. So Mm. I guess making that decision was tough, but for me, it was, I wanted to put myself in the best possible chance to actually go on to achieve my dreams of going to the Olympics. So for me, it was kind of like that decision that, you know, if, if I don't do that now, you know, in two years time, it might not be an option. It might not be something I could do. So yeah, decided to move out of home at 16, obviously with the support of my mum and dad. And yeah, it was tough having to go from, I guess, having that huge support around me to, you know, having to do the cooking, cleaning, washing up for myself and having to manage life. I had college in Swansea and then I upped my training from probably 12 to 14 hours to 20 to 25 hours. So it's kind of like a huge sit shift, but it was kind of going from that, I guess, more amateur age group level into kind of very much a professional environment where the nutritionist was there, there was physios, there was sports scientists there was strength and conditioning and I hadn't been exposed to any any of this early on in my career so I guess to have that support and breaking everything down and it definitely shifted my my mindset and gave me a different look at like you know just what it takes to try and qualify for a a GB team you know it was not what necessarily always what you're doing in the pool it's what are you eating what are you doing in the gym what are you looking after your body your sleep all those different things so I learned a lot but I think it was you know looking back the best decision that I made for my swimming career so talk us through your regimen then from 16 onwards what was it how many hours a week were you training and how much how how much commitment was there in terms of your week towards the swimming? Do you know what I mean? Because obviously, if you it's not just the training, is it? It's the other stuff on top of it. So, you know, were you full time engaged, or were you working as well and balancing this? How did that look? 
Yeah, so I would swim six till eight in the morning. So we'd swim for two hours in the morning and then I would get breakfast at the pool and then walk normally straight up to college. So obviously at 16, couldn't drive either. So I was either trying to get lifts from people or being able to walk to college. It is a very steep hill um, (laughs) in Swansea. So it was always a bit of a challenge after after swimming. But yeah, I'd swim six till eight, have a day at college and um, then come back. Obviously I have work to do and we'd swim again in the evening, five till seven. So I would, you know, have that most days of the week. Um, that would be a typical day. I would have 20 hours of swimming in a week. And on top of that, there'd be gym training, there'd be physio appointments, there'd be so many different things. And yeah, I guess I'd really kind of thrown myself into it. And um, it was a big change. I was tired a lot. I had no idea about nutrition and the importance of all those little things. And I remember one morning, even when I look back, um, I'd probably been living in Swansea maybe six months at the time. And I actually slept in one morning. So I don't know what happened, whether I didn't forgot to set my alarm or I slept through and just switched it off and snoozed it and didn't realise. But I remember waking up and I'd like missed swimming and I hadn't gone to college. And I like looked at my phone. I was like, oh my God, like I've missed swimming. (laughs) And like, I felt over come with emotion so I rang my coach and I was crying I was saying I'm so sorry like I've missed swimming like I don't know what happened and he was like don't worry he said if, if you've slept through like your body clearly needed to sleep and I guess what was like a young girl like just yeah I was couldn't believe that I'd missed missed a swimming session <laughs> whereas you know my coach I guess it kind of said to me look your body clearly needed it I'm there's there's no um there's no harm in sleeping in one morning and your dreams are over that's what you should have said yeah (laughs) (laughs) it's all over for you jazz you've got to go back to to Bradford on even you (laughs) (laughs) yeah so um I guess again just learned so much and developing but you know at 16 I was I was young I I had no idea about um again what you know the commitment of swimming and what it was required of me and I quickly had to learn and start to become quite professional while also I guess at 16 being quite probably hormonal I was quite sensitive and where'd you live in Swansea so I lived in Sketty oh I know it yeah yeah so I lived with other swimmers which which definitely helped and you know we lived in a swimmer's house and we were surrounded by swimmers so I think that definitely was was great for me having that support at such a young age as living with other swimmers definitely uh made it easier and you were not far from the gower either which is one of the nicest parts of the world in my opinion i love rossilli and all that so i'm not sure if you've got any sea swimming in but uh yeah i would highly recommend it if you have i'm sure you probably have many times <laughs> but um <laughs> But yeah, it's a good place to socialize and to spend that time in your life, I suppose, isn't it? But uh, so I, I want to talk about major competitions. I'm assuming your training is cyclical and periodized around trials, around competitions, et cetera, et cetera. So how do you prepare for a major competition? Maybe talk about the Olympics. When does your preparation for the Olympics start and how do you prepare for such an incredible event like that? When I look back, we would normally work in four year cycles. So we would have, you know, four years between the Olympics, which, you know, which is what makes the Olympics so great is it's not every day. It's not, you know, next weekend. It's not every year. It's every four years, which definitely kind of heightens, I guess, the excitement and the emotions from like an athlete level and uh, everything every four years. But we'd normally work in four year cycles. So every four years, you'd plan out the year, the following year, it'd be a world championships, uh, following year, Commonwealth Games and Europeans. And then the next year, world championships and then you finish off with with the olympics so it would be based off that for a four for, for, for a four year plan but you know when i look back i probably say you know i was spending my whole life training really for that moment in the olympics because you know i might have been four years of focus but also all the years in the lead up and the training it doesn't kind of just switch on because it's the olympics but yeah. um I guess that four year cycle when it's kind of hitting the stepping stones, as I said, the kind of process to get there. I remember my coach saying a year before the Olympics, he always says, you know, this is the year that we have the Olympic shift. So the year before the Olympics, he said, I want you to absolutely give 110%. There's no stones unturned, you know, making sure that you give like absolutely everything this year. And even though I felt like I was doing that the year before and the year before that it's kind of like that kind of shift in your mindset that you know every 
I guess, decision that you make, every thing that you do is kind of having that in the back of your mind. This is my kind of shift towards the Olympics. I'm doing this for the Olympics. You know, if there's a weekend, you know, in the lead up to a competition that you have free, it's, you know, making the decision for your performances. You know, I should actually stay home, rest and recover and relax and shouldn't be out walking 10 miles on a weekend because my legs will be tired for the competition that I've got coming up. So, I guess in the Olympics, we would have the trials, which were run in March or April, April, I think. And then you have the Olympics in in August. Mm. So you only have one week to qualify for the Olympics. So even though you've trained for years and years for that moment, if you're ill or injured, there, there's no like no choices. You have to qualify in that week. There's sure. no let offs. So I guess you've prepared, but it does bring a lot of kind of emotions and yeah pressure in that to that week to make sure that you're at your very best to qualify for the Olympics and it's not even necessarily always about achieving the qualifying time to go or anything it's about you've got to become in the top two more so in British swimming now you've got to win the event to kind of guarantee your place and get the time to go so yeah sure. it's a lot of pressure a lot of pressure in that one week but um I actually found the Olympic trials was more stressful than the Olympics itself which is yeah. which is funny but that kind of pressure to get there once I was there, I loved it, enjoyed every every minute of it. Yeah, I can imagine that though. Because once you're you're gearing up to that, that that sort of trial, I suppose, you know what I mean? There's such a big prize. To to just go to the Olympics is incredible, isn't it? Where I'm going with this is, is that you obviously I've I've heard you talking about this in the past on how you had a process or a protocol leading up to a race whereby you would do it's the same sort of thing each time, listen to the same music, do this, you know. So so the question is, you must be in, you know, reasonably high pressure situations these days, even if it's a call with an important client or something like that. But is there anything from your sporting life that you've taken through to your professional career, your new career, in terms of dealing with high pressure situations and being able to perform at the right time? Oh, a hundred percent. And um it's funny because when I look back now, even with my career and, you know, as you say, taking on like a kind of new journey, I feel like I could never experience the same amount of pressures and like highs that I've experienced, like in sports, you know, the environment. And, you know, if I didn't perform at the international competition, like my funding would be taken off me. So that would give me nothing. I would have nothing to train with. I would have to look after my own finances. But also, like, I guess with swimming, the competition, there has always been that. And I've been surrounded by in a competitive environment since I was, I remember doing my first competition at like seven or eight years old, I was competing. And so it kind of feels like it's just part of my lifestyle. So I love being in a pressure environment. I feel like I thrive in a pressured environment. Mm. I feel like it brings the best out of me. I feel like I perform at my best and I enjoy those moments because you know, when you retire from sport, it can feel like, you know, you've experienced so many highs and adrenaline and pressure environments. Now I actually am like grateful and love, love those environments. And I feel like it brings out the best in me. So I do bring lots from my swimming career now. And as I said, I I still love, love that feeling, which um, definitely taken into my new career. Most 13 year old girls don't, you know, get up at five in the morning to go and do two hours in the pool. And then, you know, move to a, like a hundred miles away from where you're from just to to, to, to vote to a career to, to, you know, to athletics. You obviously had natural talent, but, you know, talent doesn't really get you to the Olympics. It's an enormous amount of dedication and drive. Why, why have you got that dedication and drive? Where does it come from? <laughs> the golden question. <laughs> Looking back, I think when I have a look at it, you know, I think who I was surrounded by has played a really huge part. I've been very lucky to have coaches that have really challenged me, have, you know, really managed to get the best out of me and inspired me and motivated me, but also my mum and dad. I actually think I'm the least competitive in my family. My mum and dad are super (laughs) competitive as well. Don't play any board games with them because honestly <laughs> I was gonna say trivial pursuits must be interesting <laughs> around Christmas time then it? Yeah. <laughs> um but no I think I guess being surrounded but I remember from a young age my mum and dad giving me exposure and getting me to try out so many different sports and I loved it I absolutely love sport I still do now 
But I guess having that exposure, like swimming was just a sport I loved. And I always remember my dad saying to me, I'll race you to the football post or I'll race you to the tree. Or there was kind of always a kind of that competitive side of things. Yeah. And then probably just nurtured by some incredible coaches and some incredible people around me that have really given me the the power to use, I guess, as you say, use, you will have some form of natural talents as well. But having the mindset to go with it is probably half the battle and also a struggle yeah. as well. So I think they've got to work hand in hand. But, you know, learning from so many different situations in life. I remember my dad has had two strokes, so he was in hospital for, for a large amount of time. And swimming was that escape for me. It was that place where I could go and my head would be in the water and I could really escape and give me some focus. It's always been that place that I'd loved. And, you know, at times there, there has been challenges and uh, some tears after after some poor races. But at the end of the day, like I loved the ability to be able to race. I loved being in that environment, the adrenaline. But to say, I guess, where it's come from, probably some maybe born with, some nurtured from family and coaches, but probably learning from experience as well, which has been you know, the more you learn from experience, the more it kind of drives you on to be better each day. You miss it? Oh, I do miss parts of it. I do miss parts of it. I miss the competitions and the the racing and I miss feeling like I was, you know, in the best shape and the fittest, one of the fittest distance swimmers in the world. I miss those feelings. But I think, you know, for me, looking back, I was ready to hang up my goggles, as you say. Yeah. It was the right time. I'd achieved everything I'd wanted to and I was kind of ready for ready for a new chapter. So I do look back probably with with great memories and that I was ready to step away instead of, I guess, coming from the other angle where injuries or different things can can force force people to to hang up the goggles. But for me it was kind of from a place of being ready and ready to take on a new chapter. If you could change anything about your career what would what would it be what regrets do you have I actually don't think I have any regrets I think I learned so much from my swimming career obviously missing out on the London 2012 Olympics with glandular fever was a huge disappointment but I guess coming back to the Rio Olympics would I have achieved and had that experience in Rio I'm, I'm not sure so I actually wouldn't really change anything I think if I could probably do one thing it would be to tell myself to I wish I had more confidence in myself I was always kind of questioning myself if I was good enough have I done enough work because when I look back at some of the things that I used to do in swimming I'm you know some of the training sessions were world class were unbelievable but it's only now when I reflect and I look back on them now and I'm like why didn't I have the confidence because looking now I think wow that is incredible but at the time I was always chasing to be better and to do it faster and to be stronger all those different things instead of actually I guess having the confidence in what I was doing and believing in myself there's so much wasted talent off the back of lack of confidence isn't it it's 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 something that affects so many people in fact it affects everyone really doesn't it but um but look I want on a on a bit more of a jovial note, Jazz. Okay, I'm sure people would be fascinated to know what's the Olympic Village like. I heard there's a McDonald's there. Is that true? <laughs> yeah, there's a McDonald's in the <laughs> Athletes Village. It's pretty great, you know. You must have come across some people like Usain Bolt and stuff like that. You must have a little bit of like, oh my God, look who's by there. It's Michael Phelps or something, you know. It must be an incredible place though. Yeah, it's just very surreal, I think. You know, being surrounded by world-class athletes and seeing Andy Murray train on the tennis courts and in the village and seeing Usain Bolt just walking around the village. And it's just surreal, you know, all sports stars being in one place and being in a village. But yeah, it is a bit of a crazy experience. And, you know, for me, the highlight is probably the dining hall, 24 hours of food, just as many different <laughs> foods as you can imagine. But yeah, it's it's a real, inc- really incredible place. And a bit surreal. You kind of feel like you're in a bubble, but obviously know that you've got some like really important races that you've been training your whole life for as well. (laughs) Well, I've got to ask you, when you know when people finish and they maybe win a gold medal and they want to like celebrate a little bit, do they kind of get put in a different part of the village? Because obviously they don't want to be noisy with this other athletes trying to go to sleep for their main event the next day. How does that dynamic work? Or do they just get kicked out straight away when their participation in the Olympics ends? Yeah, no, you all stay in the village. So 
it's kind of like a, a tower block, a hotel kind of thing. Uh, okay. And the swimmers are known to like finish early. So they put you on like the top floor or the bottom floor. So you're kind of away sure. from other sports. So they do try and like put the sports that are like done closer together, closer to each other. So they don't disrupt anyone else. But yeah, you're not moved to anywhere special. So uh, you just have to, I guess, work around it. <laughs> <laughs> Fair play. Okay, no worries. Uh, look, you decided to hang your goggles up, as you called it. And then you obviously embark on a career in the sort of tech world. Well, how did that come about? Actually, let's talk about that day when you decided to retire or the lead up to that day. And then how you ended up you know, going on the path that you have. How did that come about? Yeah. So I guess from my side of things, you know, after Rio, I... I kind of started doing some open water swimming. So I would do some 10 kilometer races and I went to the Commonwealth Games. Didn't have my best, best races there. I came back and um, I had pneumonia after the Commonwealth Games. So I was kind of quite, quite ill that year. And I guess a lot of different bits going on, but, you know, I, I started to think I have achieved everything I want to in the sport. And as I said, with illnesses and different bits, you know, do I want to keep pushing myself and do I still have it in me to go to another Olympics? And, you know, it was a difficult decision, but it was, it was something that I felt like I was ready for. So, you know, as hard as it was and the transition and the adapting to normal life, and I guess my whole identity has been around swimming, it felt like the right time. So you know, looking back at 28 is, is, is one on the older end for swimming. So I don't think it was kind of a huge shock, but definitely the, the right time and the right decision for me. And even though it was a bit of kind of a transition going through everything and getting used to a different way of life. And, you know, I've always done sport because, you know, that's what I've done. And it turned into my career, if you, if you call it that. So I guess then adjusting to, you know, doing sport now because for enjoyment and for fun, still kind of adjusting, adjusting to that and getting used to, to normal life. Yeah, for sure. So you took a bit of a break, uh, you know, after swimming, I take it then. And then did, did you go straight into sort of a like a tech orientated role? Or was there a bit of a lead up to a build up to that? Or what, and I, I know you work for Source Whale as well. So maybe you could tell how that come about and um, what Source Whale do. Yeah, so I was very lucky, you know, when I retired from swimming that a lot of different opportunities came my way. So from school visits, swimming camps, corporate talks, events, traveling, various different bits, which, you know, I've I've really loved and enjoyed doing. I love giving back to sport. I love being able to still work in sport. Um, but it was only, I guess, over the last... I've, after, over the last couple of years, especially kind of during COVID, it really made me miss that feeling of always feeling, I guess, like I'm on a pathway. You know, as I said, that four year cycle of the Olympics, there was always something at the end of each year that I was really driving towards that was challenging me each and every day. And it was only at the start of this year that I spoke to a mentor and they said, look, I think you should look at the, the tech space. It's um, very similar to sport you get rewarded for your hard work it's a very challenging fast-paced environment you know there can be a lot of pressure in, involved and you know there are a lot of similarities with sport there's there's activity numbers to hit there's as you say the pathway so I then started to look at my options and um, funny enough I applied to quite a few different roles and I was knocked back several times with no experience no experience no experience and I was thinking well, how am I, how am I supposed to get experience if I can't get my foot in the door anywhere? So it was, it was quite difficult with that. But for me, I ended up with an opportunity at my previous company called SAS Leads. I did an interview with them and it seemed to go down really well. They seemed to, to love me and my energy and I guess what I had to offer with my experience. So they said they'd train me into a sales role to be an SDR coach. So essentially I did four weeks of inter- intense learning, you know, all around the fundamentals of sales. And, you know, it was a real learning for me. I was like, wow, all <laughs> these different points and things that I guess I hadn't really been exposed to. I've been yeah. used to, in a way, sounds bad, selling myself, you know, with with sponsorship and different things. But sure. learning something new, I absolutely loved. And 
kind of threw myself into it really. And then after that, I would take on, I took on a group of SDRs. So I was coaching them on all the things I'd learned and yeah, yeah, really using the kind of mentoring experience that I have and all the things I'd learned through sport to be able to develop them as like individuals, but also as a coach. And then I was in that role for, for four to five months. And unfortunately the kind of company took a bit of a downturn and more recently has gone into administration. So I guess it led me into looking for different roles. And I was very lucky as soon as I'd had experience on my CV that a lot of more people were interested sure. in talking with me. And I was lucky with a few different opportunities to come my way. But I came across Source Whale and to be honest, it was recommended by my old manager. And he said, I think you should look at them. They're a great group. And that's where it started off, really. I um, I spoke with them. And to be honest, I love the team. I got a real feel of the the team and the energy and the they were very similar to me with the kind of very optimistic very positive people and yeah loved the product so um I ended up joining them I've been with them coming up to three months so it's a crazy new challenge I'm now an SDR manager and I'm managing a team of we've got seven SDRs and again using lots of different experiences coaching them, mentoring them, working with them to help them develop in the best way possible and supporting them to challenge them in different ways, but also to try and try and get the best out of them and support them as much as possible. So yeah, I guess that's kind of what led me to the tech space, a bit of a long answer. <laughs> yeah, you've, you've been working in the tech sector for a couple of months then. And um, yeah, obviously Source Whale sounds, sounds fantastic. They seem to be in line with, you know, the way the recruitment technology sector is moving, you know what I mean, to these platforms whereby, you know, companies do uh, resource through these sort of intermediary platforms. The one thing that really stands out for me is that you come into technology, the, the tech sector, it, at, an, at the, the sort of beginning of this work from home revolution. So you never really had to, you know, go in, um, into the office nine to five every day. But nonetheless, there was still probably a big shift for you in terms of your life as a swimmer into the structure of your working week as a, as, as a you know, a, a business person, so to speak. You know, how did you adapt? Was that hard for you? Or was it a doddle? Because you used to get it up at 5 a.m. and go and swim in, I suppose. <laughs> yeah, it's actually, it's not been too bad, to be honest. I think because I'd had a bit of time after swimming as well, I guess I'd had that time to go off and do various different things. And yeah, would I guess being behind a desk all day and being behind a computer can be challenging at times. Um, I have actually been looking at like maybe a, a walking desk or like a standing desk. So I am not sat down all, all the time. But I don't find the challenge. The days just seem to go so quickly and I love the group that I work with. And I guess, you know, when you're being challenged every day and when you're working with a great group, the days just seem to go so quickly. And I normally go into the office into London once once a week. So I guess I still get that kind of group experience to be around everyone, um, you know, even if I am I'm not there every day so we I guess have that kind of flexible working where you can work from home you can go into the office but I do love being around people I think you know being able to just bounce a question or being around people you feel like you can get a lot more from people so look the technology sector are you a bit of a techie at heart Jazz uh, what, what tech innovation are you most excited by in the world right now it's funny, isn't it? Because I probably wouldn't say that I am the most tech person. I like to think, I guess, how I th how I think and how I am. I'm quite forward thinking and, you know, it can adapt and change quite quickly. It's fast paced. So I'm very similar yeah. with that. But I guess in terms of the tech world, I'm still very new to it and still getting to know a lot of different platforms. Obviously, in my previous role, I used a lot of kind of tools to, to allow the SDRs to perform at their best. And now using Sourceware, we use the tool to the SDRs and my team are using Sourceware every single day. So I guess when you're using the tech as well, you definitely do get a bit more passionate and do love it. Sure. So it's an impressive bit of kit and it's, um, yeah, you can see the true power of it when you're using it as well, which, def which definitely helps. Yeah, definitely. It sounds like you're more passionate about the on the people side, though. Yeah, I would say more passionate about the people and um, the support, I guess, of the team that I've got. But 
it obviously does help when you've got a really great product as well and yeah. being able to share that but yeah i guess the people the people and the support but when you've got a great product and product around um it def- it definitely uh makes it makes a big impact so you also do some coaching on the side and you're also involved with swim whales is that the case yeah so we still do some coaching some one to one coaching and some swim camps which which is great because it still allows me to still i guess be involved still have my foot in the water or toes in the water as you say but it's 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 great you know i still can have that have that relationship with swimmers and being able to give back to the sport but also with swim whales and you know i do work with their kind of development programs to to support them so being able to have have a mixture and still be able to be involved in sport in some way definitely uh yeah it gives me a lot of fulfillment on on both ends really so if you you're looking back now then jazz if you could give yourself at the beginning of your career you know a single piece of advice what what would you say oh it's a tricky one there's probably a few things i know i mentioned around the confidence yeah that always believing in sure. yourself and being able to you know you can only do your best always give your best and 100%. And I think probably from like a career perspective, it's, you know, learning to always ask questions, never be afraid to ask a question, no matter how small or, you know, if something doesn't make sense, I always just encourage people to ask questions. I'd rather you ask questions because either that means like, it's not maybe been explained as well, or, you know, there's not been an understanding of it. So asking questions, like, sure, I love, I love just being able to ask questions and explore and understand. So yeah, they do, do you know? Do you know what, Jazz? That is something that holds so many people back: is having childlike curiosity. You know, sort of basically having the, the bravery to just ask essentially stupid questions. They're not stupid questions because you know most most of the time they're fine questions. But asking questions which could be perceived as being stupid questions, it kind of paralyzes some people, and they never ask the questions, so therefore they never fully understand things. Do, do you see what I mean? Yeah, that's exactly what I mean. And for me, it's I always ask questions and I always try to understand it as deep as possible and sure. just being able to ask as many questions and not be afraid. It's is you never look silly. Um, you know, it's better to actually develop yourself and understand it further than, you know, go in the unknown and not really quite know. So asking questions, I'd say, is definitely a powerful one. Yeah, for sure. I knew you're a fan of the chimp paradox, which I massively would recommend uh, myself as well. I'm a big fan of that book. But aside from that, or maybe that, if you want to want to emphasize that one, what book or piece of other content would, would you recommend or that you, that you have been inspired by? Yeah, there's probably been a few. I, as you say, the chimp paradox, I have read a lot about that. And as I said earlier, you know, having that, there could be a hundred voices telling you, you can't do it and you're not ready, but listening to that one voice. And so we used to work a lot with that in swimming. I think another book that I read throughout sport that I do feel is quite profound now is Feel the Fear and Do It Anyway. And that was always something that really helped me, I guess, in my career is, you know, you will have fear and there will be times where, you know, you're not sure if you can do this, but you still can do it. Do you know the author of that? Oh, I'm not 100% sure. Because we'll pop it on the show notes, but I'll check that one out. I have heard of that one, but I I don't, yeah, not read it. We'll dig that out and put it on the show notes, I think. Yeah, that was one of the books. And then probably from a sales perspective, I read Chris Voss, Never Split the Difference, um, when I was kind of recommended by by a mentor. And um, I guess in sales and in life and understanding, and it was actually really useful. And, you know, I recommend it to a lot of the SDRs, just how from an FBI negotiator actually working in sales and trying to understand. And I think it's it's really useful in sales. So they're probably yeah, the three sure. that I've used. Yeah, never split the difference. Uh, absolute classic. I've read that one myself. It's a it's a brilliant uh, a brilliant read for sure. So so what what's next for Jazz Carlin then? What what, are you, what have you got coming up that you're excited about? What endeavours are you involved with right now? To be honest, I guess the team I'm working with now. Just looking forward to you know keep building the team, and it's an exciting time. We had our best ever month in November, so I think everyone was talking about the doom and gloom of of sales in November, and the team the team smashed it. So I guess carrying that on and developing the team as much as possible, and then really just to keep going with that, keep you know keeping my foot in in sport and being able to give back. But, you know, I'm, I'm all one for consistency. So just being able to, as you say, consistently working with the team and supporting and um, having consistency, I guess, leads leads to the best results. So, yeah, I guess lots to look forward to, but it, it feels difficult to say on one thing just to, to keep the momentum going. 
Brilliant. Well, Jazz, thank you so much. I've really enjoyed chatting. I mean, there was so much there. I've never interviewed somebody with uh, such a sterling background of achievements and just really, really uh, brilliant to unpack some of the amazing experiences that you've been lucky enough and hardworking enough to achieve. So yeah, thank you for that. It's been really, it's been, it's been some fantastic insight. Thank you for coming on the Tech Leaders Podcast. Well, where can people find you, by the way? Yeah, so on LinkedIn as Jazz Carlin. And yeah, I'm on kind of social media platforms, um, Twitter and Instagram as well, at Jazz Carlin with swim camps and various different bits. So yeah, mixture of LinkedIn and social media, just at Jazz Carlin. There are so many pivotal moments in this conversation which we could throw out there, but I would like to emphasize two points. Firstly, Jazz had setbacks in her career lots of them as you know everyone does um from being told that she wasn't an elite swimmer um at the age of 13 uh, right through to missing out on the london 2012 olympics with glandular fever which was heartbreaking for jazz at the time and you know so jazz talks about utilizing those setbacks as fuel and you know essentially things like proving people wrong for example uh, but also you know having faith in the process and believing in yourself uh, you know, in terms of motivating yourself for the next challenge. So she talks about how her coaches gave her a foundational framework to success. And she knew that if she followed uh, those protocols and those processes, she would get close to her best, but needed to stay confident in herself. Um, and and, and com- self-confidence is a big part of what we discussed. Interestingly, Jazz also mentioned that she got more nervous for the Olympic trials than the Olympics themselves, but that just goes to show how much pressure comes from within. You know, putting pressure on yourself is, is sometimes the, the most intense type of pressure. And that leads us on, this is quite a salient point, and leads us on really well to the second thing that really stood out for me, which is dealing with high pressure situations. Jazz talks openly about how she gets mentally prepared for important commitments by utilizing uh, mindset shifts and techniques that she learned during her career. Essentially, uh, you know what, what she emphasized uh, most was focusing on the process, not the outcome, um, which may be counterintuitive for some people who've uh, who put this. It may sound a little bit upside down, but, but Jazz explained it really well and, and just mentioned that you need to break the journey down to reach the destination and focusing on breaking down that training program or whatever it is into digestible chunks so that you've got those small wins going through the process of, the, of, of meeting a bigger goal. Um, I thought that was fascinating. She also talks about drawing on her experience of preparing for major events quite a lot through the conversation and, and, and sort of shifting mindset and making sacrifices to achieve goals. I thought that was fascinating. I think the competitor... Uh, will will always be in there, and um, yeah, I think you know she's she's a fascinating character. There's some incredible achievements, so yeah, I, I hope you enjoyed it as much as I loved doing it. It was a fantastic conversation. So I just want to take this opportunity to thank you for downloading this episode. We really love doing this show and are absolutely humbled by all of the incredible people who download and listen, plus the incredible guests who take the time to come on and share their secrets and experiences with our listeners. Please, can I ask that you take a couple of seconds to subscribe or follow the show. This small action means a lot to us and helps us greatly. Thank you. As you quite possibly have heard me mentioning in the past, we record the mass majority of our episodes at an amazing studio facility here in Cardiff at Tramshed Tech. Tramshed Tech is a collaborative community of entrepreneurs and scaling businesses geared towards supporting growth in tech, digital and creative industries across an ever-increasing collection of locations and partner locations UK-wide and internationally. It really is the perfect place for your business to start up, scale up, accelerate or innovate. Head over to tramshedtech.co.uk or just search Tramshed Tech on your favourite social media platform.